Henry VI, Part 1, often referred to as 1 Henry VI, is a history play by William Shakespeare, and possibly Christopher Marlowe and or Thomas Nash, believed to have been written in 1591, and set during the lifetime of King Henry VI of England, whereas Henry VI, Part 2 deals with the king's inability to quell the bickering of his nobles, and the inevitability of armed conflict, and Henry VI, Part 3 deals with the horrors of that conflict. Henry VI, Part 1 deals with the loss of England's French territories and the political machinations leading up to the Wars of the Roses, as the English political system is torn apart by personal squabbles and petty jealousy. Although the Henry VI trilogy may not have been written in chronological order, the three plays are often grouped together with Richard III to form a tetralogy covering the entire Wars of the Roses saga, from the death of Henry V in 1422 to the rise to power of Henry VII in 1485. It was the success of this sequence of plays that firmly established Shakespeare's reputation as a playwright. Some regard Henry VI, Part 1 as the weakest of Shakespeare's plays and, along with Titus Andronicus, it is generally considered one of the strongest candidates for evidence that Shakespeare collaborated with other dramatists early in his career. Characters Duke of Somerset A conflation of John Bufour, First Duke of Somerset and his younger brother Edmund Bufour, 2nd Duke of Somerset, Earl of Warwick, Richard de Beauchamps, 13th Earl of Warwick, often mistakenly identified as Richard Neville, 16th Earl of Warwick, from Henry VI, Part II and Henry VI, Part III, Edmund Mortimer, Earl of March, a conflation of Sir Edmund Mortimer and his nephew, Edmund Mortimer, 5th Earl of March, Messengers, a captain, lawyer, a jailer, soldiers, heralds, scouts, on both the English and French sides. Synopsis The play begins with the funeral of Henry V, who has died unexpectedly in his prime, as his brothers, the Dukes of Bedford and Gloucester, and his uncle, the Duke of Exeter, lament his passing and express doubt as to whether his son, the as yet uncrowned heir apparent Henry VI, is capable of running the country in such tumultuous times. Word arrives of military setbacks in France. A rebellion, led by the Dauphin Charles, is gaining momentum, and several major towns have already been lost. Additionally, Lord Talbot, Constable of France, has been captured, realizing a critical time is at hand. Bedford immediately prepares himself to head to France and take command of the army. Gloucester remains in charge in England, and Exeter sets out to prepare young Henry for his forthcoming coronation. Meanwhile, in Orleans, the English army is laying siege to Charles's forces. Inside the city, the bastard of Orleans approaches Charles and tells him of a young woman who claims to have seen visions and knows how to defeat the English. Charles summons the woman, Joan Lapicelle, i.e., Joan of Arc, to test her resolve. He challenges her to single combat. Upon her victory, he immediately places her in command of the army. Outside the city, the newly arrived Bedford negotiates the release of Talbot, but immediately, Joan launches an attack. The French forces win, forcing the English back but Talbot and Bedford engineer a sneak attack on the city, and gain a foothold within the walls, causing the French leaders to flee. Back in England, a petty quarrel between Richard Plantagenet and the Duke of Somerset has expanded to involve the whole court. Richard and Somerset ask their fellow nobles to pledge allegiance to one of them, and as such the lords select either red or white roses to indicate the side they are on. Richard then goes to see his uncle, Edmund Mortimer, imprisoned in the Tower of London. Mortimer tells Richard the history of their family's conflict with the king's family, how they helped Henry Bolingbroke seize power from Richard II, but were then shoved into the background. 
and how Henry V had Richard's father, Richard of Kingsburg, executed and his family stripped of all its lands and monies. Mortimer also tells Richard that he himself is the rightful heir to the throne, and that, when he dies, Richard will be the true heir, not Henry. Amazed at these revelations, Richard determines to attain his birthright, and vows to have his family's dukedom restored. After Mortimer dies, Richard presents his petition to the recently crowned Henry, who agrees to reinstate the Plantagenet's title, making Richard third Duke of York. Henry then leaves for France, accompanied by Gloucester, Exeter, Winchester, Richard and Somerset. H. C. Selous illustration of Joan's fiends abandoning her in Act 5, Scene 3, from the plays of William Shakespeare. The historical plays, edited by Charles Cowden Clark and Mary Cowden Clark. In France, within a matter of hours, the French retake and then lose the city of ruin. After the battle, Bedford dies, and Talbot assumes direct command of the army. The Dauphin is horrified at the loss of ruin, but Joan tells him not to worry. She then persuades the powerful Duke of Burgundy, who had been fighting for the English, to switch sides, and join the French. Meanwhile, Henry arrives in Paris and upon learning of Burgundy's betrayal, he sends Talbot to speak with him. Henry then pleads for Richard and Somerset to put aside their conflict, and, unaware of the implications of his actions, he chooses a red rose, symbolically aligning himself with Somerset and alienating Richard. Prior to returning to England, in an effort to secure peace between Somerset and Richard, Henry places Richard in command of the infantry and Somerset in command of the cavalry. Meanwhile, Talbot approaches Bordeaux, but the French army's wings around and traps him. Talbot sends word for reinforcements, but the conflict between Richard and Somerset leads them to second-guess one another, and neither of them send any, both blaming the other for the mix-up. The English army is subsequently destroyed, and both Talbot and his son are killed. After the battle, Joan's visions desert her, and she is captured by Richard, and burned at the stake. At the same time, urged on by Pope Eugenius IV and the Holy Roman Emperor, Sigismund, Henry sues for peace. The French listen to the English terms, under which Charles is to be a viceroy to Henry, reluctantly agreeing, but only with the intention of breaking their oath at a later date and expelling the English from France. Meanwhile, the Earl of Suffolk has captured a young French princess, Margaret of Anjou, whom he intends to marry to Henry in order that he can dominate the king through her. Traveling back to England, he attempts to persuade Henry to marry Margaret. Gloucester advises Henry against the marriage, as Margaret's family is not rich, and the marriage is not advantageous to his position as king. But Henry is taken in by Suffolk's description of Margaret's beauty, and he agrees to the proposal. Suffolk then heads back to France to bring Margaret to England as Gloucester worryingly ponders what the future may hold date and text. Date The most important evidence for dating one Henry VI is the diary of Philip Henslow, which records a performance of a play by Lord Strange's men called Harry B.J. I. E. Henry VI, on 3 March 1592 at the Rose Theatre in Southwark. Henslow refers to the play as, nay, which most critics take to mean, new, although it could be an abbreviation for the Newington Butts Theatre, which Henslow may have owned the only other option is that Harry V.J. is a now lost play. That Harry V.J. is not a lost play however seems to be confirmed by a reference in Thomas Nash's Pierce Penniless, his supplication to the devil, entered into the stationer's register on 8 August 1592 which supports the theory that Harry V.J. is one Henry VI. Nash praises a play that features Lord Talbot. How would it have joyed brave Talbot, the terror of the French, to think that after he had lain 200 years in his tomb, he should triumph again on the stage. 
and have his bones new embalmed with the tears of 10,000 spectators, at least, who in the tragedy and that represents his person imagine they behold him fresh bleeding. Quote, it is thought that Nash is here referring to Harry V.J. I. E. 1 Henry VI, as there is no other candidate for a play featuring Talbot from this time period. Although again, there is the slight possibility that both Henslow and Nash are referring to a now lost play. If Nash's comment is accepted as evidence that the play seen by Henslow was 1 Henry VI, to have been on stage as a new play in March 1592 it must have been written in 1591. There is a separate question concerning the date of composition however. Due to the publication in March 1594 of a quarto version of 2 Henry VI, under the title The First Part of the Contention Betwixt the Two Famous Houses of York and Lancaster, with the death of the good Duke Humphrey, and the banishment and death of the Duke of Suffolk, and the tragic all end of the proud Cardinal of Winchester, with the notable rebellion of Jack Cade, and the Duke of York's first claim unto the crown. One argument against this theory is that 1 Henry VI is the weakest of the trilogy and therefore, logic would suggest it was written first. This argument suggests that Shakespeare could only have created such a weak play if it was his first attempt to turn his chronicle sources into drama. In essence, he was unsure of his way, and as such, 1 Henry VI was a trial run of sorts making way for the more accomplished 2 Henry VI and 3 Henry VI. Emerus Jones is one notable critic who supports this view. As this implies, there is no critical consensus on this issue. Samuel Johnson, writing in his 1765 edition of the plays of William Shakespeare, preempted the debate and argued that the plays were written in sequence, it is apparent that numerous more recent scholars continue to uphold Johnson's argument. E. M. W. Tilliard, for example, writing in 1944, believes the plays were written in order, as does Andrew S. Currencross in his editions of all three plays for the second series of The Art and Shakespeare. E. A. J. Hanegman also agrees, in his Early Start Theory of 1982, which argues that Shakespeare's first play was Titus Andronicus, which Honigman posits was written in 1586. Likewise, Michael Hathaway, in both his 1990 New Cambridge Shakespeare edition of 1 Henry VI and his 1991 edition of 2 Henry, v argues that the evidence suggests 1 Henry VI was written first. In his 2001 introduction to Henry VI, Critical Essays, Thomas A. Pendleton makes a similar argument, as does Roger Warren in his 2003 edition of 2 Henry VI for the Oxford Shakespeare. On the other hand, Edward Burns, in his 2000 Art and Shakespeare third series edition of 1 Henry VI and Ronald Knowles, in his 1999 Art and Shakespeare third series edition of 2 Henry VI make the case that 2 Henry VI probably preceded 1 Henry VI. Similarly, Randall Martin, in his 2001 Oxford Shakespeare edition of 3 Henry VI argues that 1 Henry VI was almost certainly written last. In his 2003 Oxford edition of 1 Henry VI, Michael Taylor agrees with Martin. Additionally, it is worth noting that in the Oxford Shakespeare, complete works of 1986 and the second edition of 2005, and in the Norton Shakespeare of 1997 and again in 2008, both 2 Henry VI and 3 Henry VI precede 1 Henry VI. Ultimately, the question of the order of composition remains unanswered and the only thing that critics can agree on is that all three plays, in whatever order, were written by early 1592 at the latest. Text The text of the play was not published until the 1623 first folio, under the title The First Part of Henry VI. When it came to be called Part One is unclear.
Although most critics tend to assume it was the invention of the first folio editors, John Heminges and Henry Condell, as there are no references to the play under the title Part 1, or any derivative thereof, prior to 1623. Analysis and Criticism Critical History Some critics argue that the Henry VI trilogy were the first plays based on recent English history, and as such, they deserve an elevated position in the canon, and a more central role in Shakespearean criticism. According to F. P. Wilson for example, there is no certain evidence that any dramatist before the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, dared to put upon the public stage a play based upon English history. Another issue often discussed amongst critics is the quality of the play, along with three Henry VI. One Henry VI has traditionally been seen as one of Shakespeare's weakest works, with critics often citing the amount of violence as indicative of Shakespeare's artistic immaturity and inability to handle his chronicle sources, especially when compared to the more nuanced and far less violent second historical tetralogy, Richard II, one Henry IV, two Henry IV and Henry V. For example, critics such as E. M. W. Tilliard, based upon these theories, one Henry VI, with its numerous onstage skirmishes and multiple scenes of violence and murder, was considered a coarse play with little to recommend it to the intelligentsia. On the other hand, however, writers like Thomas Haywood and Thomas Nash praised battle scenes in general as often being intrinsic to the play and not simply vulgar distractions for the illiterate. In Piers Penniless, Nash praised the didactic element of drama that depicted battle and martial action, arguing that such plays were a good way of teaching both history and military tactics to the masses. In such plays, our forefathers' valiant acts, that have lain long buried in rusty brass and worm eaten books, are revived. Nash also argued that plays that depict glorious national causes from the past rekindle a patriotic fervor that has been lost in the puerility of an insipid present, and that such plays provide a rare exercise of virtue in reproof to these degenerate effeminate days of ours. Quote, Questions of originality and quality, however, are not the only critical disagreement one Henry VI has provoked. Numerous other issues divide critics, not the least of which concerns the authorship of the play. Attribution Studies A number of Shakespeare's early plays have been examined for signs of co-authorship. The Taming of the Shrew, The Contention, The belief that Shakespeare may have written very little of one Henry VI first came from Edmund. Malone in his 1790 edition of Shakespeare's plays, which include a dissertation on the three parts of King Henry VI, in which he argued that the large number of classical allusions in the play was more characteristic of Nash, Peel, or Green than of early Shakespeare. Malone also argued that the language itself indicated someone other than Shakespeare. This view was dominant until 1929, when Peter Alexander challenged it. In perhaps the most exhaustive analysis of the debate, the 1995 article, Shakespeare and Others, The Authorship of Henry VI, Part 1, Gary Taylor suggests that approximately 18.7% of the play was written by Shakespeare. Taylor argues that Nash almost certainly wrote all of Act 1, but he attributes to Shakespeare 2, 4, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, 4, 5, 4, 6, and 4, 7 through line 32. Taylor also suggests that the Temple Garden scene, in which the rival factions identify themselves through the selection of red and white roses, may have been a later addition. Scenes 4, 5 to 4, 7 include a series of rhyming couplets between Talbot and his son, which, while unusual to our ears, apparently had an electric effect upon early audiences. Quote, Other than Taylor, however, 
Several other critics also disagree with Warren's assessment of the quality of the language, arguing that the passages are more complex and accomplished than has hitherto been allowed for. Michael Taylor, for example, argues that the rhyming dialogue between the Talbots, often stitch on mythic, shapes a kind of noble flighting match. A competition as to who can out-oblige the other, can thus be attributed to an ascetic choice on his part, rather than offered as evidence of co-authorship. Other scenes in the play have also been identifying as offering possible evidence of co-authorship. For example, the opening lines of Act 1, Scene 2 have been argued to show clear evidence of Nash's hand. The scene begins with Charles proclaiming, Mars, his true moving, question mark, even as in the heavens, so in the earth, question mark, to this day is not known. I, E, 1, 2, some critics believe that this statement is paraphrased in Nash's later pamphlet Have With You Do, Saffron Walden, which contains the line, you are as ignorant as the astronomers are in the true movings of Mars, which to this day, they never could attain to. The problem with this theory however, as Michael Hathaway has pointed out, is that there is no reason as to why Nash couldn't simply be paraphrasing a play he had no involvement in. A common practice in Elizabethan literature, Shakespeare and Marlowe, for example often paraphrased each another's plays. Nasheeb Sheehan offers more evidence, again suggestive of Nash. When Alan Kahn compares the English to Samson's and Goliath's, I, E, 33, the word Goliath, Sheehan argues is unusual in so far as all Bibles in Shakespeare's day spelt the name Goliath. It was only in much older editions of the Bible that it was spelt Goliath. Sheehan concludes that the use of the arcane spelling is more indicative of Nash, who was prone to using older spellings of certain words than Shakespeare, who was less likely to do so. However, evidence of Shakespeare's authorship has also been found within the play. For example, Samuel Johnson argued that the play was more competently written than King John, Richard II, 1 Henry IV, 2 Henry IV and Henry V, and therefore, not attributing it to Shakespeare based on quality made little sense. A similar point is made by Lawrence V. Ryan, who suggests that the play fits so well into Shakespeare's overall style, with an intricate integration of form and content, that it was most likely written by him alone. Another aspect of the debate is the actual likelihood of Shakespeare collaborating at all. Some critics, such as Hathaway and Karen Cross, argue that it is unlikely that a young, up-and-coming dramatist trying to make a name for himself would have collaborated with other authors so early in his career. On the other hand, Michael Taylor suggests it is not difficult to construct an imaginary scenario that has a harassed author calling on friends and colleagues to help him construct an unexpectedly commissioned piece in a hurry. Quote, Obviously, this suggestion is based on the theory that the contention and true tragedy formed a two-part sequence that was extended into a trilogy due to its popularity. Another argument that challenges the co-authorship idea is that the basic theory of co-authorship itself was originally hypothesized in the 18th and 19th century due to a distaste for the treatment of Joan. Critics were uncomfortable attributing such a harsh depiction to Shakespeare, so they embraced the co-authorship theory to clear his name, suggesting that he couldn't have been responsible for the merciless characterization of Joan, and as such, someone else must have written her scenes. As with the question of the order in which the trilogy was written, 20th century editors and scholars remain staunchly divided on the question of authorship. Edward Burns, for example, in his 2000 edition of the play for the Art and Shakespeare Third series, suggests that it is highly unlikely that Shakespeare wrote alone, and wrote his introduction and commentary. He refers to the writer not as Shakespeare but as the dramatists. He also suggests that the play should be more properly called Harry V. by Shakespeare, Nash and others. 
On the other hand, Michael Taylor believes that Shakespeare almost certainly wrote the entire play, as does J. J. M. Tobin, who, in his essay in Henry VI, Critical Essays, argues the similarities to Nash do not reveal the hand of Nash at work in the composition of the play, but instead reveal Shakespeare imitating Nash. As such, similarly to the question of the order of composition, critics remain staunchly divided on the issue of authorship. In 2016, Oxford University Press announced that it will credit Christopher Marlowe as co-author alongside Shakespeare for all three Henry VI plays in its new Oxford Shakespeare series. Language The very functioning of language itself is literally a theme in the play, with particular emphasis placed on its ability to represent by means of signs. Semiosis The power of language to sway The aggressive potential of language the failure of language to adequately describe reality and the manipulation of language so as to hide the truth. The persuasive power of language is first alluded to by Charles, who tells Joan after she has assured him she can end the siege of Orleans. Thou hast astonished me with thy high terms. This sense is repeated when the Countess of Auvergne is wondering about Talbot and says to her, Servant, great is the rumor of this dreadful night and his achievements of no less account. Fain would mine eyes be witness with mine ears, to give their censure of these rare reports. Like Charles, Overn has been astonished with the high terms bestowed on Talbot, and now she wishes to see if the report and the reality conflate. Later in the play, the persuasive power of language becomes important for Joan, as she uses it as a subterfuge to sneak into ruin, telling her men, be wary how you place your words. Talk like the vulgar sort of market men that come to gather money for their corn. Later, she uses language to persuade Burgundy to join with the Dauphin against the English. As Burgundy realizes he is succumbing to her rhetoric, he muses to himself, either she hath bewitched me with her words, or nature makes me suddenly relent. Here, language is shown to be so powerful as to act on Burgundy the same way nature itself would act, to the point where he is unsure if he has been persuaded by a natural occurrence or by Joan's words. Language is thus presented as capable of transforming ideology. As Joan finishes her speech, Burgundy again attests to the power of her language. I am vanquished. These haughty words of hers, have battered me like roaring cannon shot, and made me almost yield upon my knees. Later, something similar happens with Henry, who agrees to marry Margaret merely because of Suffolk's description of her, in a line that echoes Burgundy's. Henry queries what it is that has prompted him to agree to Suffolk's suggestion, whether it be through force of your report, my noble lord of Suffolk, or for that, my tender youth was never yet attained with any passion of inflaming love. I cannot tell. Here, again, the power of language is shown to be so strong as to be confused with a natural phenomenon. Charles William Sharp Engraving of Talbot and the Countess of Overn by William Quiller Orchardson Language can also be employed aggressively. For example, after the death of Salisbury, when Talbot first hears about Joan, he contemptuously refers to her and Charles as Puzzle or Puzzle, Dolphin or Dogfish. In French, Puzzle means slut, and Puzzle is a variation of Pucelle, meaning virgin, but with an added negative connotation. These two words, Puzzle and Puzzle, are both puns on Joan's name, Pucelle, thus showing Talbot's utter contempt for her. Other examples of words employed aggressively are seen when the English reclaim Orleans, and a soldier chases the half-dressed French leaders from the city, declaring, The cry of Talbot serves me for a sword, for I have loaded me with many spoils, using no other weapon but his name. A similar notion is found when the Countess of Overn meets Talbot, and muses, is this the Talbot so much feared abroad, that with his name the mothers still their babes? Here words, specifically Talbot's name, literally become weapons, 
and are used directly to strike fear into the enemy. However all the words are occasionally shown to be powerful and deeply persuasive. They also often fail in their signifying role. Exposed is incapable of adequately representing reality. This idea is introduced by Gloucester at Henry V's a funeral, where he laments that words cannot encompass the life of such a great king. What should I say? His deeds exceed all speech. Later, when Gloucester and Winchester confront one another outside the Tower of London, Gloucester champions the power of real action over the power of threatening words. I will not answer thee with words but blows. Similarly, after the French capture Rouen and refuse to meet the English army in the battlefield, Bedford asserts, Oh let no words, but deeds, revenge this treason. Another example of the failure of language is found when Suffolk finds himself lost for words, whilst attempting to woo Margaret. Fain would I woo her, yet I dare not speak. I'll call for pen and ink and write my mind. Fie, de la pole, disable not thyself, hast not a tongue. Quote. Later, Joan's words, so successful during the play in convincing others to support her, explicitly fail to save her life. As she is told by Warwick, Strumpet, thy words condemn thy bread and thee. Use no entreaty, for it is in vain. Language as a system is also shown to be open to manipulation. Words can be employed for deceptive purposes, as the representative function of language gives way to deceit. For example, shortly after Charles has accepted Joan as his new commander, Alan Kahn calls into question her sincerity, thus suggesting a possible discrepancy between her words and her actions. These women are shrewd tempters with their tongues. Another example occurs when Henry forces Winchester and Gloucester to put aside their animosity and shake hands. Their public words here stand in diametric opposition to their private intentions. Act 2, Scene 4 is perhaps the most important scene in the play in terms of language, as it is in this scene where Richard introduces the notion of what he calls dumb significance, something that carries resonance throughout the trilogy. During his debate with Somerset, Richard points out to the lords who are unwilling to openly support either of them, since you are tongue-tied and loath to speak, in dumb significance proclaim your thoughts. Quote, L. 25, 26, the dumb significance, he refers to are roses, a red rose to join Somerset, a white rose to join Richard. As such, the roses essentially function as symbols replacing the very need for language. Once all the lords select their roses, these symbolize the houses they represent. Henry chooses a red rose, totally unaware of the implications of his actions, as he does not understand the power the dumb significance question mark, have. He places his trust in a more literal type of language, and thus selects a rose in what he thinks is a meaningless gesture but that does in fact have profound implications. Henry's mistake results directly from his failure to grasp the importance of silent actions and symbolic decisions. A gesture, especially such an ill-considered one, is worth and makes worthless. A thousand pretty words. Quote. Themes Death of Chivalry A fundamental theme in the play is the death of chivalry the decline of England's empire over France and the accompanying decay of the ideas of feudalism that had sustained the order of the realm. Quote, Talbot's description of fast oaths actions stands in direct contrast to the image of an ideal knight, and as such, the ideal and the reality serve to highlight one another, and thus reveal the discrepancy between them. Henry V has this function throughout much of the play, he is presented not as a man but as a rhetorical construct fashioned out of hyperbole, as a heroic image or heraldic icon. Quote. The play, however, D-O-E-S-N-T simply depict the fall of one order. It also depicts the rise of another. How the nation might have remained true to itself is signified by the words and deeds of Talbot. 
What she is in danger of becoming is signified by the shortcomings of the French. Failings that crop up increasingly amongst Englishmen. Talbot's mode of chivalry is replaced by politicians concerned only with themselves and their own advancement. Winchester, Somerset, Suffolk, even Richard, as Jane Howell, director of the BBC Shakespeare adaptation argues, what I was concerned about in the first play, patriotism, hand in hand with the examination of chivalry with which the play engages is an examination of patriotism. Indeed, some critics argue that patriotism provided the impetus for the play in the first place. England defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588, leading to a short-lived period of international confidence and patriotic pride. But by 1590, the national mood was one of despondency. And as such, one Henry VI may have been commissioned to help dispel this mood. The patriotic emotions to which this play shamelessly appeals resonate at an especially fragile time politically speaking. Frightening memories of the 1588 Spanish Armada, or of the Babington Plot of 1586, which led to the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, concerns over a noticeably declining and still unmarried Queen Elizabeth, worries over Catholic recusancy, fear of military involvement in Europe, and, just as disquietingly, in Ireland, combined to make a patriotic response a matter of some urgency. Evidence of this is seen throughout. For example, the English seem vastly outnumbered in every battle, yet they never give up, and often they prove victorious. Indeed, even when they do lose, the suggestion is often made that it was because of treachery, as only by duplicitous means could their hardiness be overcome. For example, during the Battle of Pate, where Talbot is captured, the messenger reports, here fast oaths betrayal is the direct cause of the English defeat, not the fact that they were outnumbered ten to one, that they were hit by a surprise attack or that they were surrounded. This notion is returned to several times, with the implication each time that only treachery can account for an English defeat. For example, upon hearing of the first loss of towns in France, Exeter immediately asks, how were they lost? What treachery was used? Quote, Upon losing ruin, Talbot exclaims, France, thou shalt rue this treason with thy tears, if Talbot but survive thy treachery. Later, when thinking back on the French campaign, Richard asks Henry, Have we not lost most part of all the towns, by treason, falsehood and by treachery? H. C. Selu's illustration of Talbot engaging in battle in Act 4. Scene 6, from the plays of William Shakespeare, the historical plays, edited by Charles Cowden Clark and Mary Cowden Clark. As such, the play presents, to a certain extent, the English image of themselves is somewhat in line with the French image of them, with both stressing resoluteness and steadfastness. Another component of the patriotic sentiment is the religious note the play often strikes. On the whole, Everything Catholic is represented as bad. Everything Protestant is represented as good. The play's popularity Henry V is also cited as an example of Protestant purity. He was a king blessed of the King of Kings. Unto the French the dreadful judgment day, so dreadful will not be as was his sight. The battles of the lords of hosts he fought. King of Kings is a phrase used in 1 Timothy 6, 15. Lords of Hosts is used throughout the Old Testament, and to say Henry fought for the Lord of Hosts is to compare him to the warrior king, David, who also fought for the Lords of Hosts in 1 Samuel 25, 28. However, despite the obvious celebratory patriotic tone and sense of Protestant English religio-political identity, as with the lamentation for the death of chivalry, the play is somewhat ambiguous in its overall depiction of patriotism. Ultimately, the play depicts how the English lost France, a seemingly strange subject matter if Shakespeare was attempting to instill a sense of national 
pride in the people. This is rendered even more so when one considers that Shakespeare could have written about how England won France in the first place. The popularity of Armada rhetoric during the time of 1 Henry VI's composition would have seemed to ask for a play about Henry V, not one which begins with his death and proceeds to dramatize English loses. Quote, in this sense then, the depiction of patriotism, although undoubtedly strong, is not without ambiguity. The very story told by the play renders any patriotic sentiment found within to be something of a hollow victory. Saintly versus demonic demons, spirits, witches, saints and God are all mentioned on numerous occasions within the play, often relating directly to Joan, who is presented as a fascinating mixture of saint, witch, naive girl, clever woman, audacious warrior and sensual tart. Quote, Joan is introduced into the play by the bastard, who, even before anyone has seen or met her, says, a holy maid hither with me I bring. Later, after Joan has helped the French lift the siege of Orléans, Charles declares, no longer on Saint Denis will we cry, but Joan Le Pucelle shall be France's saint. Similarly, when Joan reveals her plan to turn Burgundy against the English, Alan Kahn declares, We'll set thy statue in some holy place, and have thee reverenced like a blessed saint. On the other hand, however, the English see her as a demon. Prior to her combat with Talbot, he exclaims, Devil or devil's dim, I'll conjure thee, blood will I draw on thee, question mark, thou art a witch, and straightway give thy soul to him thou serves it. Then, after the fight, he says, my thoughts are whirled like a potter's wheel. I know not where I rhyme nor what I do. A witch, by fear, not force, like Hannibal, drives back our troops and conquers as she lists. Upon arriving in France, Bedford condemns Charles for aligning himself with Joan. How much he wrongs his fame, despairing of his own arms fortitude, to join with witches and the help of hell. Talbot responds to this with, well, let them practice and converse with spirits. God is our fortress. Later, Talbot refers to her as, Pacelle, that witch, that damned sorceress and foul fiend of France, and hag of all despite, declaring, I speak not to that railing Hecate. Prior to executing her, York also calls her a bell-banning hag. Having failed in her efforts to convince the English she is a holy virgin, and that killing her will invoke the wrath of heaven. She alters her story and claims she is pregnant, hoping they will spare her for the sake of the child. She then lists off various French nobles who could be her child's father in an effort to find one who the English respect. In this sense then, Joan leaves the play as neither saintly nor demonic, but as a frightened woman pleading fruitlessly for her life. An important question in any examination of Joan is the question of whether or not she is a unified, stable character who vacillates from saintly to demonic, or a poorly constructed character. Now one thing, now the other. According to Edward Burns, Joan cannot be read as a substantive realist character, a unified subject with a coherent singly identity. Quote, Michael Hathaway offers an alternate sympathetic view of Joan that argues that the character's movement from saintly to demonic is justified within the text. Joan is the play's tragic figure, comparable with Falcon Bridge and King John. She turns to witchcraft only in despair. It cannot be taken as an unequivocal manifestation of diabolic power. Quote, Another theory is that Joan is actually a comic figure and the huge alterations in her character are supposed to evoke laughter. Michael Taylor, for example, argues, a fiendish provenance replaces a divine one in Joan, and the French in general, are treated predominantly as comic figures. Joan, Brenda Blethyn, Alan Kahn, Michael Byrne, The Bastard, Brian Prothero, Reignier, David Dacre, and Charles, Ian Sainer, are treated as buffoons for the most part, and there is no indication of any malevolence. 
significantly. When Joan S. Fiends abandon her, we never see them. We simply see her talking to empty air. Examples of the comic treatment of the characters are found during the Battle of Orleans, where Joan is ludicrously depicted as defending the city from the entire English army single-handed, whilst Talbot stands by incredulously watching his soldiers flee one after another. Another example appears in Act 2, Scene 1, as the five of them blame one another for the breach in the watch at Orleans that allowed the English back into the city. Their role as comic figures is also shown in Act 3, Scene 2. After Joan has entered Rouen and the others stand outside waiting for her signal, Charles is shown sneaking through a field holding a helmet with a large plume up in front of his face in an effort to hide the notion of demonic agency and saintly power. However, is not confined to Joan. For example, in the opening conversation of the play, speculating as to how Talbot could have been taken prisoner. Exeter exclaims, Shall we think the subtle-witted French, conjurers and sorcerers, that, afraid of him, by magic verse have contrived his end. Later, discussing the French capture of Orléans, Talbot claims it was contrived by art and baleful sorcery. Indeed, the French make similar claims about the English. During the Battle of Pate, for example, according to the messenger, the French exclaimed the devil was in arms. Later, as the English attack Orleans. Here, much as the English had done when they were being defeated by Joan, the French attribute diabolic power to their vanquishers. Unlike the English, however, the French acknowledge that Talbot must be either a demon or a saint. As far as the English are concerned, Joan is demonic. It is not open to question. Performance After the original 1592 performances, the complete text of 1 Henry VI seems to have been rarely acted. The first definite performance, after Shakespeare's day was on 13 March 1738 at Covent Garden, in what seems to have been a standalone performance, as there is no record of a performance of either 2 Henry VI or 3 Henry VI. In 1953, Douglas Seal directed a production of 1 Henry VI at the Birmingham Repertory Theatre, following successful productions of 2 Henry VI in 1951 and 3 Henry VI in 1952. All three plays starred Paul Daneman as Henry and Rosalind Boxall as Margaret, with 1 Henry VI featuring Derek Godfrey as Talbot and Judy Dench as Joan. A 1977 production at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre made much of its unedited status. Terry Hands presented all three Henry VI plays with Alan Howard as Henry and Helen Mirren as Margaret. Though the production had only moderate box office success, critics lauded it for Alan Howard's unique portrayal of Henry. Howard adopted historical details concerning the real Henry's madness into his performance, presenting the character as constantly on the brink of a mental and emotional breakdown possibly as a reaction to a recent adaptation of the trilogy under the general title Wars of the Roses, which was strongly political. Question mark. Hans attempted to ensure his own production was entirely apolitical. Wars of the Roses was a study in power politics. Its central image was the conference table, and Warwick, the scheming kingmaker, was the central figure. But that's not Shakespeare. Shakespeare goes far beyond politics. Politics is a very shallow science. Aside from Howard and Mirren, the production starred David Swift as Talbot and Charlotte Cornwell as Joan. Under the direction of Michael Boyd the play was presented at the Swan Theatre in Stratford in 2000, with David Oyelowo as Henry and Keith Bartlett as Talbot. Both Margaret and Joan were played by Fiona Bell. As Jonas burned, Bell symbolically rose from the ashes as Margaret. The play was presented with the five other history plays to form a complete eight-part history cycle under the general title This England. The histories, the first time the Royal Shakespeare Company, RSC, had ever attempted to stage the eight plays as one sequence. This England, 
The Histories was revived in 2006 as part of the Complete Works Festival at the Courtyard Theatre, with the Henry VI plays again directed by Boyd, and starring Chuck Iwuji as Henry and Keith Bartlett reprising his role as Talbot. Katie Stevens played both Margaret and Joan. When the Complete Works wrapped in March 2007, the History plays remained on stage, under the shorter title The Histories, as part of a two-year, 34-actor ensemble production. One Henry VI was performed under the title Henry VI, Part 1, The War Against France. At the end of the two-year program, the entire octology was performed over a four-day period under the title The Glorious Moment. Richard II was staged on a Thursday evening, followed by the two Henry IV plays on Friday afternoon and evening, the three Henry VI plays on Saturday two afternoon performances and one evening performance, and Richard III on Sunday evening. Boyd's production garnered much attention at the time because of his interpolations and additions to the text. Most notably, Boyd introduced a new character into the trilogy, called The Keeper. The character never speaks, but upon the death of each major character, The Keeper, played by Edward Clayton in 2000, and by Anthony Bunsey in 2006-2007, wearing all red, would walk onto stage and approach the body. The actor playing the body would then stand up and allow himself to be led off stage by the figure. The production was also particularly noted for its realistic violence, according to Robert Gorlington of the Daily Express. In his review of the original 2000 production, blood from a severed arm sprayed over my lap, a human liver slopped to the floor by my feet, an eyeball scudded past, then a tongue, quote. In 2012, the trilogy was staged at Shakespeare's Globe as part of the Globe to Globe Festival, with each play performed by a different Balkans-based company and offered as a commentary on the recent history of violence in that region. One Henry VI was staged by National Theatre Belgrade, directed by Nikita Milivojevic, and starring Hadzi Nenad Marisic as Henry Nabaj, Akindasina as Talbot and Yelena Jolvizan as Joan. Apart from the 1738 performance at Covent Garden, about which nothing is known, there is no evidence of one Henry VI having ever been performed as a standalone play. Unlike both to Henry VI, which was initially staged as a single play by Douglas Seale in 1951, and three Henry VI, which was staged as a single play by Katie Mitchell in 1994. Outside the UK, the first major American performance was in 1935 at the Pasadena Playhouse in California, directed by Gilmore Brown as part of a production of all ten Shakespearean histories. The two tetralogies, preceded by King John and preceded by Henry VIII. In Europe, unedited stagings of the play took place at the Weimar Court Theatre in 1857, directed by Franz von Dingelstedt. It was performed as the sixth part of the octology, with all eight plays staged over a ten-day period. A major production was staged at the Berg Theater in Vienna in 1873, with a celebrated performance from Friedrich Mitterwerzer as Winchester. Joxus of its directed a production of the Tetralogy at the Munich Court Theater in 1889 and again, in 1906. In 1927, Saladin Schmidt presented the unedited Octology at the Municipal Theater in Bochum. Dennis Yarko staged the Tetralogy as one 12 hour piece in Carcassonne in 1978 and in Kratil in 1979. Adaptations Theatrical Evidence for the first adaptation of One Henry VI is not found until 1817, when Edmund Keane appeared in J. H. Maribel's Richard, Duke of York or the contention of York and Lancaster at Drury Lane, which used material from all three Henry VI plays, but removed everything not directly related to York. The play ended with his death, which occurs in Act 1, Scene 4 of 3 Henry VI. 
Material used from 1 Henry VI includes the temple garden scene, the Mortimer scene and the introduction of Margaret. Following Merivale's example, Robert Atkins adapted all three plays into a single piece for a performance at the Old Vic in 1923. As part of the celebrations for the tercentenary of the first folio, Guy Martineau played Henry, Esther Whitehouse played Margaret, Ernest Meads played Talbot and Jane Bacon played Joan. The success of the 1951 53 Douglas Seal standalone productions of each of the individual plays in Birmingham prompted him to present the three plays together at the Old Vic in 1957 under the general title The Wars of the Roses. Barry Jackson adapted the text, altering the trilogy into a two-part play. One Henry VI and two Henry VI were combined, with almost all of one Henry VI eliminated and 3 Henry VI was edited, Seal again directed, with Paul Daneman again appearing as Henry, alongside Barbara Shepherd as Margaret. The roles of both Talbot and Joan were removed, and 1 Henry VI was reduced to three scenes. Question mark. The funeral of Henry V, the temple garden scene and the introduction of Margaret. The production usually credited with establishing the reputation of the play in the modern theatre is John Barton and Peter Hall's 1963-1964 RSC production of the Tetralogy, adapted into a three-part series, under the general title The Wars of the Roses, at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. The first play, entitled simply Henry VI, featured a much shortened version of 1 Henry VI and half of 2 Henry VI, up to the death of Bufour. The second play, entitled Edward IV, featured the second half of 2 Henry VI and a shortened version of 3 Henry VI, which was followed by a shortened version of Richard III as the third play. In all, 1. 450 lines written by Barton were added to 6. 000 lines of original Shakespearean material, with a total of 12. 350 lines removed. Another major adaptation was staged in 1987 by the English Shakespeare Company, under the direction of Michael Bogdanov. This touring production opened at the Old Vic, and subsequently toured for two years, performing at, amongst other places, the Panasonic Globe Theatre in Tokyo. Japan, as the inaugural play of the arena, the Festival de du Monde in Spoleto, Italy and at the Adelaide Festival in Australia. Following the structure established by Barton and Hall, Bogdanov combined a heavily edited 1 Henry VI and the first half of 2 Henry VI into one play, Henry VI, and the second half of 2 Henry VI and 3 Henry VI into another, Edward IV and followed them with an edited Richard III. Also like Barton and Hall, Bogdanov concentrated on political issues, although he made them far more overt than had his predecessors. For example, played by June Watson, Margaret was closely modeled after the British Prime Minister at the time, Margaret Thatcher, even to the point of having similar clothes and hair. Likewise, Paul Brennan's Henry was closely modeled after King Edward VIII, Prior to his abdication, however, the series was a huge box office success. Alongside Watson and Brennan, the play starred Michael Fenner as Talbot and Mary Rutherford as Joan. Another adaptation of the Tetralogy by the Royal Shakespeare Company followed in 1988, performed at the Barbican, adapted by Charles Wood and directed by Adrian Noble. The Barton Hall structure was again followed reducing the trilogy to two plays by dividing two Henry VI in the middle. The resulting trilogy was entitled The Plantagenets, with the individual plays entitled Henry VI, The Rise of Edward IV and Richard III, His Death, starring Ray Fiennes as Henry, Penny Downey as Margaret, Mark Hadfield as Talbot and Julia Ford as Joan, the production was extremely successful with both audiences and critics. Michael Bogdanov and the English Shakespeare Company presented a different adaptation at the Swansea Grand Theatre in 1991, 
using the same cast as on the touring production. All eight plays from the history cycle were presented over a seven-night period, with each play receiving one performance only, and with only 28 actors portraying the nearly 500 roles. Whilst the other five plays in the cycle were unadapted, the Henry VI plays were combined into two, using the Barton Hall structure, with the first named the House of Lancaster and the second, the House of York. In 2000, Edward Hall presented the trilogy as a two-part series at the Watermill Theatre in Newbury. Hall followed the Jackson Seal structure, combining one Henry VI and two Henry VI into one play that all but eliminated one Henry VI, and following this with an edited version of three Henry VI. This production was noted for how it handled the violence of the play. The set was designed to look like an abattoir, but rather than attempt to present the violence realistically, as most productions do, Hall went in the other direction, presenting the violence symbolically. Whenever a character was decapitated or killed, a red cabbage was sliced up whilst the actor mimed the death beside it. In 2001, Tom Marcus directed an adaptation of the Tetralogy at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival, condensing all four plays into one. Marcus named the play Queen Margaret, doing much the same with the character of Margaret as Merivale had done with York. Margaret was played by Gloria Beagler, Henry by Richard Harratine, York by Lars Tatum and Gloucester by Charles Wilcox. The only scene from one Henry VI was the meeting between Margaret and Suffolk. Another unusual 2001 adaptation of the Tetralogy was entitled Shakespeare's Rugby Wars, written by Matt Toner and Chris Cocaluzzi, and directed by Cocaluzzi. The play was acted by the Upstart Crow Theatre Group and staged outdoors at the Robert Street playing field as part of the Toronto Fringe Festival presented as if it were a live rugby match between York and Lancaster. The play featured commentary from Falstaff, Stephen Flett, which was broadcast live for the audience. The match itself was refereed by Bill Shakespeare, played by Cocaluzzi, and the actors, whose characters' names all appeared on their jerseys, had microphones attached and would recite dialogue from all four plays at key moments. In 2002, Leon Rubin presented the Tetralogy as a trilogy at the Stratford Shakespeare Festival in Ontario, using the Barton Hall method of combining one Henry VI with the first half of two Henry VI, and the second half of two Henry VI with three Henry VI. The plays were renamed Henry VI, Revenge in France and Henry VI, Revolt in England. Michael Thierry played Henry. Shauna McKenna played Margaret, Brad Ruby played Talbot and Michelle Giroux played Joan. Also in 2002, Edward Hall and the Propeller Company presented a one-play all-male cast modern dress adaptation of the trilogy at the Watermill Theatre. Under the title Rose Rage, Hall used a cast of only 13 actors to portray the nearly 150 speaking roles in the four-hour production thus necessitating doubling and tripling of parts. Although a new adaptation, this production followed the Jackson Seal method of eliminating almost all of one Henry VI. Joan was completely absent. The original cast included Jonathan McGuinness as Henry, Robert Hans as Margaret and Keith Bartlett as Talbot. After a successful run at the Watermill, the play moved to the Chicago Shakespeare Theatre, the American cast included Carmen La Chivita as Henry, Scott Parkinson as Margaret and Fletcher McTaggart as Talbot. Outside England, a major adaptation of the Tetralogy took place in 1864 in Weimar under the direction of Franz von Dingelstadt, who, seven years previously had staged the play unedited. Dingelstadt turned the trilogy into a two-parter under the general name Divisa Rose. The first play was called House Lancaster, the second House York. This adaptation was unique insofar as both plays were created by combining material from all three. Henry VI plays, following this structure, 
Alfred von Walzogen also produced a two-part play in 1875, under the general title Edward IV. Another European adaptation was in 1965 at the Teatro Piccolo in Milan. Directed by Giorgio Streller it went under the title Il Giogo del Potenti, the play of the mighty. Using Barton and Hall's structure, Streller also added several characters, including a chorus, who used monologues from Richard II, both parts of Henry IV, Henry V, Macbeth and Timon of Athens, and two great eggers called Bevis and Holland, after the names of two of Cade's rebels in the folio text of two Henry VI, who commented, with dialogue written by Streller himself, on each of the major characters as they set about burying them. Film the only cinematic adaptation of the play came in the 1973 horror comedy film Theater of Blood, directed by Douglas Hickox. Vincent Price stars in the film as Edward Lionheart, self, regarded as the finest Shakespearean actor of all time, when he fails to be awarded the prestigious Critics Circle Award for Best Actor. He sets out exacting bloody revenge on the critics who gave him poor reviews with each act inspired by a death in a Shakespeare play. One such act of revenge involves the critic Chloe Moon. Coral Brown, Lionheart electrocutes Moon using a pair of hair curlers, whilst he recites excerpts from Act 5, Scene 4 of 1 Henry VI, where Joan is sentenced to burn at the stake. Television the first television adaptation of the play was in 1960 when the BBC produced a serial entitled An Age of Kings. The show comprised 1560 and 75 minute episodes that adapted all eight of Shakespeare's sequential history plays, directed by Michael Hayes and produced by Peter Dews, with a script by Eric Crozier. The production featured Terry Scully as Henry. Mary Morris as Margaret and Eileen Atkins as Joan. The ninth episode, under the title The Red Rose and the White, presented a heavily abridged version of One Henry VI, with the episode only running one hour. Obviously a great deal of text was removed. Perhaps the most significant cuts were the complete removal of the character of Talbot, and the excision of all battle scenes in France. In 1965, BBC One broadcast all three plays from John Barton and Peter Hall's The Wars of the Roses trilogy, Henry VI, The Rise of Edward IV and Richard III, with David Warner as Henry and Peggy Ashcroft as Margaret, directed for television by Robin Midgley and Michael Hayes. The plays were presented as more than simply film theatre, with the core idea being to recreate theatre production in televisual terms question mark, not merely to observe it, but to get to the heart of it. Quote. Another television version of the play was provided by the BBC in 1981 for their BBC television Shakespeare series. Although the episode didn't air until 1983, directed by Jane Howell, the play was presented as the first part of the tetralogy, all four adaptations directed by Howell, with linked casting. Henry was played by Peter Benson, Margaret by Julia Foster, Talbot by Trevor Peacock and Joan by Brenda Blethyn. Howell's presentation of the complete first historical tetralogy was one of the most lauded achievements of the entire BBC series, and prompted Stanley Wells to argue that the productions were probably purer than any version given in the theatre since Shakespeare's time. Quote, Joan, Brenda Blethyn faces off against Talbot, Trevor Peacock, during the Siege of Orleans. Note the brightly colored, adventure playground, set, which stands out against the obviously studio-bound parquet flooring. Inspired by the notion that the political intrigues behind the Wars of the Roses often seemed like playground squabbles, Howell and production designer Oliver Bailden staged the four plays in a single set resembling a children's adventure playground. However, little attempt was made at realism. For example, Bailden did not disguise the parquet flooring. It stops the set from literally representing 
for the most part. Howell's adaptation is taken word for word from the first folio, with only some relatively minor differences. For example, the adaptation opens differently to the play, with Henry VI singing a lament for his father. Another difference is that Fastolf's escape from Rouen is seen rather than merely mentioned. Also worth noting is that Act 5, Scene 1 and Act 5, Scene 2 are reversed so that Act 4, Scene 7 and Act 5, Scene 2 now form one continuous piece. Additionally, numerous lines were cut from almost every scene. Some of the more notable omissions include, in Act 1, Scene 1, Absent are Bedford's references to children crying and England becoming a marsh since Henry V died. Posterity await for wretched years, when, at their mother's moistened eyes, babes shall suck, our isle be made a marish of salt tears, and none but women left to wail the dead. Quote, L. 48, 51, in Act 1, Scene 2, Alan Khan's praise of the resoluteness of the English army is absent. Royce Art, a countryman of ours, records, England all Olivers and Rowlands bred, during the time Edward III did reign. More truly now may this be verified. For none by Samson's and Goliath's, it sendeth forth to skirmish. Quote, L. 29, 34, in Act 1, Scene 3, some of the dialogue between Gloucester and Winchester outside the tower is absent. L. 36, 43, Whilst in Act 1, Scene 5, so too is Talbot's complaint about the French wanting to ransom him for a prisoner of less worth, but with a baser man of arms by far. Once in contempt they would have bartered me, which I, disdaining, scorned, and craved death rather than I would be so vile esteemed. L. 8. 11. In Act 1, Scene 7, some of Charles's praise of Joan is absent. A statelier pyramist her isle rear, than Rhodopes of Memphis ever was. In memory of her, when she is dead, her ashes, in an urn more precious than the rich jeweled coffer of Darius, transported shall be at high festivals, before the kings and queens of France. L. 21, 27, in Act 3, Scene 1, some of Warwick's attack on Winchester is absent. You see what mischief, and what murder too, hath been enacted through your enmity. L. 27, 28, in Act 4, Scene 6, some of the dialogue between Talbot and John has been removed. L. 6, 25, the most interesting omissions come in Act 4, Scene 7. In this scene, 12 of Joan's 16 lines have been cut. The entire seven-line speech where she says John Talbot refused to fight her because she is a woman. L. 37, 43. The first three lines of her five-line mockery of Lucy's listing of Talbot's titles. Here's a silly, stately style indeed. The Turk, that two and fifty kingdoms hath. Writes not so tedious a style as this. L. 72, 75 and the first two lines of her four-line speech where she mocks Lucy. I think this upstart is old Talbot's ghost. He speaks with such a proud commanding spirit. L. 86, 88. These omissions reduce Joan's role in this scene to a virtual spectator. And coupled with this, Brenda Bluthen portrays the character as if deeply troubled by something. Presumably the loss of contact with her, fiends, Another notable stylistic technique used in the adaptation is the multiple addresses. Direct to camera, much more so than in any of the sequels. The adaptation of One Henry VI has multiple characters addressing the camera continually throughout the play, oftentimes for comic effect. The most noticeable scene in this respect is Act 2, Scene 3, where Talbot meets the Countess of Overn. Almost all of her dialogue prior to line 32, If thou be he, then, thou art prisoner, is delivered direct to camera, including her incredulous description of the difference between the real Talbot and the reports she has heard of him. At one point during this speech, Overn exclaims, Alas, this is a child, a silly dwarf, L. 21, 
at which point Talbot himself looks at the camera in disbelief. The comedy of the scene is enhanced by having the 5'10 actor Trevor Peacock playing Talbot, and the 6'3 actress Joanna McCallum playing Overn. Elsewhere, addresses to the camera are found throughout the play. For example, as Bedford, Gloucester, Exeter and Winchester leave in Act 1. Scene 1. Each one reveals their intentions direct to camera. L. 166. 177. Other examples are Joan's confession of where she got her sword. The mayor's last two lines at the tower. Talbot's my thoughts are whirled like a potter's wheel. I know not where I rhyme nor what I do. A witch, by fear, not force, like Hannibal, drives back our troops and conquers as she lists. Some of Mortimer's monologue prior to the arrival of Richard. Richard's Plantagenet, I see, must hold his tongue, lest it be said, speak, Sira, when you should, must your bold verdict enter talk with lords. Else would I have a fling at Winchester. Exeter soliloquy at the end of Act 3. Scene 1. L. 190. 203. Exeter soliloquy at the end of Act 4. Scene 1. L. 182. 194. Most of the dialogue between Suffolk and Margaret as they ignore one another. And Suffolk's soliloquy, which closes the play. Also to camera is Jones, poor market folks that come to sell their corn, which is delivered as if it were a translation of the preceding line for the benefit of the non-French-speaking audience. In 1964, Austrian Channel Orf 2 presented an adaptation of the trilogy by Leopold Lindbergh under the title Heinrich VI. The cast list from this production has been lost. Radio in 1923, extracts from all three Henry VI plays were broadcast on BBC Radio, performed by the Cardiff Station Repertory Company as the third episode of a series of programs showcasing Shakespeare's plays, entitled Shakespeare Night. In 1947, BBC Third Program aired a 150-minute adaptation of the trilogy as part of their Shakespeare's Historical Plays series a six-part adaptation of the eight sequential history plays, with linked casting, adapted by Maurice Rue Ridley. King Henry VI starred John Byron as Henry and Gladys Young as Margaret. Almost the entirety of one Henry VI was cut, with everything related to the conflict in France being removed. In 1952, third program aired an adaptation of the Tetralogy by Peter Watts and John Dover Wilson under the general name The Wars of the Roses. The tetralogy was adapted into a trilogy but in an unusual way. One Henry VI was simply removed. So the trilogy contained only two Henry VI, three Henry VI and Richard III. The adaptation starred Valentine Dial as Henry and Sonia Dresdell as Margaret. In 1971, BBC Radio 3 presented a two-part adaptation of the trilogy by Raymond Rakes. Part 1 contained an abridged one Henry VI and an abridged version of the first three acts of two Henry V. Part 2 presented acts chapter 4 and 5 of two Henry VI and an abridged three Henry VI. Nigel Lambert played Henry, Barbara Jefford played Margaret, Francis de Wolf played Talbot and Elizabeth Morgan played Joan. In 1977, BBC Radio 4 presented a 26-part serialization of the eight sequential history plays under the general title Vivid Rex, Long Live the King, adapted by Martin Jenkins as part of the celebration of the Silver Jubilee of Elizabeth II. One Henry VI comprised episodes 15, Joan of Arc, and 16, The White Rose and the Red. James Lawrenson played Henry, Peggy Ashcroft played Margaret, Clive Swift played Talbot, Anna Gordon played Joan, and Richard Burton narrated. In America, in 1936, a heavily edited adaptation of the trilogy was broadcast as part of NBC Blues Radio Guild series, comprising three 60-minute episodes aired a week apart. 
The adaptation was written by Vernon Radcliffe and starred Henry Herbert as Henry and Janet Nolan as Margaret. In 1954, CBC Radio presented an adaptation of the trilogy by Andrew Allen, who combined one Henry VI, two Henry VI and three Henry VI into a 160-minute episode. There is no known cast information for this production. In 1985, German radio channel sender Fries Berlin broadcast a heavily edited 76-minute two-part adaptation of the octology adapted by Rolf Schneider, under the title Shakespeare's Rosenkrieg. Manga Ayakano's Japanese manga comic Requiem of the Rose King is a loose adaptation of the first Shakespearean historical tetralogy, covering Henry VI and Richard III. Editions of Henry VI, Part 1 Greenblatt, Stephen, Cohen, Walter, Howard, Jeannie, and Mouse, Catherine Eisman, eds, The Norton Shakespeare, based on the Oxford Shakespeare, Wells, Stanley, Taylor, Gary, Jowett, John and Montgomery, William, eds, The Oxford Shakespeare, The Complete Works, 1985-1986.